delighted to welcome you all. On behalf of Cambridge University Press, I would like to thank each one of you to I mean, taken our time on a Saturday afternoon. So a big thank you to all of you. We are indeed humble. Uh, considering there is a lot that's happening in Delhi right now. We are, there are like these great, great wide social events happening. Uh, so uh, this, is a, this is a very happy moment because uh, Cambridge Companion is a very prestigious series of the press, but interestingly it was in a desperate need for diversification because you would know that there was, there was no appearance of any uh, South Asian figure in the series, barring uh, the companion to Gandhi. It, it, was, it was strange that we never imagined that political thinkers and thought leaders from India and the Indian subcontinent should find a place in the series. So this book is path-breaking in many ways, one of this uh, one one of uh, the major reasons is it that we are, we are trying to we're trying to negotiate our own space in this international series, and we are hoping that uh, in years to come we'll have a long lineup of thought leaders, artists, uh, political thinkers, poets on uh, whose names these books will be based. Uh, we have a wonderful working relationship with Yasmin Sekia, so a big thank you to her that she continues to have our relationship with us and uh, continues to work with us. Uh, it's, been, it's been a great uh, experience to have her on board, to have her as our author. And of course, uh, Professor Aisur Rahman from Wake Forest University, thank you for giving us a chance to be able to work with you. Your great scholarship and your great ideas that come together in this book. Uh, this book is a collection of work. It brings together great historians, political scientists together to discuss and celebrate life and contributions uh, that Sir Sayyid had made and could have possibly made and could have possibly impacted our lives in variety of ways. So we, we discuss and we look forward to such a session today. Uh, we have a great panel which clearly does not require any introduction. Uh, Professor Raj Mohan Gandhi, uh, biographer and historian, had kindly agreed to participate in this. Uh, Lawrence Gauthier, who teaches at OP Jindal University, is an expert in institutional history of India. And uh, Savan Nakvi, who kindly agreed to moderate this panel for us, she she is she's a she's a face on TV. So again, one who doesn't require uh, an introduction. She's an author. She's a journalist. And we'll also have Professor Shugato Bose, who will join us. Uh, oh, he's here. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, we're not late. Actually, technically, we are late. So yeah. So Professor Bose, who teaches at Harvard University, and uh, we're looking forward to this great conversation. And uh, we should begin by, uh, I think, unwrapping the book because this is formally the release of the book. The book hits the market today. So let's unwrap the book. unusual and extremely memorable uh, event for me as an alig, having studied there from 1980 to 1986, I would have never imagined that I would actually be writing a book on Sir Sayyid along with a number of fantastic colleagues from all over the world, not only simply from America, from North America, but Canada, Europe, and India. I had several of my friends and colleagues from ANU who have contributed to this book. So I want to thank all my contributors to this book who have brought it together, and we are all here to celebrate this particular occasion. So thank you so much, my co-editor, Raisul Rahman, Asim Siddiqui, who is one of the authors, who teaches at Aligar, who is here, and several others who are not here, but are here in their spirit. I want to thank the panelists, particularly Shubhatada, Raj Mohan Gandhi, Lawrence, and Saba, who have so kindly agreed to be on the panel today to discuss this book. I know they got it at the last moment, and they're very kind to look and read the book and have an engaged discussion on this. Uh, one might ask the question, how, why should we need to think about Sir Sayyid today? Now, I'm a historian of South Asia. I started my work as a scholar of Assam, since I'm from Assam. I wrote these two books, and it was at that time I started thinking, how do you write a history of India, and particularly South Asia, beyond the map that we have been given. And the map confines us and makes us think that history is only simply a national project. 
But history is far more than a national project. It is actually a human project. And so I started thinking, who are the kind of people who had inspired us to think about history as a human project? And being an Alig, of course, I turned to Sir Sayyid. Because it is in Sir Sayyid's life, dedication, the kind of work he had done in multiple levels. And people only know him through his education level. But there are so many different aspects of Sir Sayyid that I started reading. And I started realizing that at a time that people were not thinking about what does education really mean? And what, does educa what should education look like for the future of this place called South Asia? Uniquely and interestingly, it is perhaps Sir Sayyid who thought about it. And given in today's world, as a teacher in an American university, that everybody talks about the STEM fields, how to make people better engineers and te technological kind of advanced people, the humanities and the humanistic approaches to think about education are actually becoming marginalized. Once again, Sir Sayyid became an inspiration for me because Sir Sayyid thought of education not simply as a degree that you just receive a degree for an instrumental purpose, but education is supposed to help build community. And this is very, very evident in AMU if you go even now. So many of my seniors are here, not because they are, you know, just because it's just another book, but because AMU is a fraternity, AMU is a family, and this family was actually the seeds were planted by Sir Sayyid even before AMU came into being. So this humanistic connection, the human linkages, the ethics of what we do and how we live with one another is something that I really learned from Sir Sayyid and in doing this book on Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan. So it gives us a new hope. It gives us a new direction. It gives us a new way to think about the value of education in today's time. But education, or this particular concept of what education should mean beyond the instrumental to the kind of building of communities and friendships with many different kinds of people and communities and ethnicities and religions, all different kinds of groups of people, did not just happen like that for Sir Sayyid. It was deeply connected with the historical moment of 1857 and his rethinking of how the disaster of 1857 should actually open gateways for a new future of possibilities. So I started thinking about in today's day and age, when we are going through multiple, multiple shocking events all over the world, disasters within and outside India, in America, in Europe, how can Sir Sayyid again inform us that it is in moments of ruptures that new possibilities can happen? So this book is not simply a celebration of a single figure, of course it is, all of that. But it is beyond that. It is a, Sir Sayyid is a kind of gateway to sort of think about where do we stand in the world today, both as students of, of, of our contemporary times, teachers who are teaching about different issues, but as human beings, how do we respond to disasters? How do we create new possibilities, not simply for ourselves, but for future generations to come? So Sir Sayyid becomes uh, not simply a symbol, but a way of engaging, learning from him, and taking it forward. And this is something I have to end with by saying that this book became the platform for bringing and creating community. People that I did not know, people that I knew, all came together to put together to put this book together for Rais and I, and we are deeply indebted to them for taking time out to do this companion series, this companion book, which is part of the series. But most importantly, it has also given me a renewed relationship with Aligarh, with AMU, and the alumni. We have 13 chapters of the Aligarh Association in the United States of America that meet every year. We have a big annual convention. And I cannot tell you how excitedly people are waiting for this book, not because simply they want to read the book, but because this is a moment, once again, to regain, recover, and become part of community that we all have been thinking about. So this is for you and me who have not met, and this is the book that has brought us together. I hope this friendship will grow and the friendship will blossom to develop new ways of thinking. How can we contribute to the world today and in the future and walk along with Sir Sayyid to think about this humanistic journey together? Thank you very much. Dear esteemed panelists uh, and friends, 
I, uh, and, and I'm, I'm particularly thankful uh, to Cambridge University Press and Kutsi Ahmed for the opportunity to bring this scholarship together, as Yasmin Sakya emphasized, that it brings scholarship of different people who have worked on Sar Sayyid uh, over a lifetime of scholarship to put their own perspectives on a variety of topics related to uh, Sar Sayyid. And particularly, uh, is, as many of you know, that last year was the 200th birth anniversary of Sayyid Ahmad Khan. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a moment of also uh, paying uh, respects to the kind of legacy he has left behind to us. Now, formally, I have not been an Ali, but I have been thinking hard about how does it benefit me uh, or, or the kind of institutions that he built. So as a 19th century figure, he is actually one person who radicalized education. And there are very few figures, uh, either in scale or magnitude, uh, or in spirit, uh, hard to match the spirit that uh, Sir Sayyid exhibited in terms of uh, bringing education and, 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 and making people think about differently in terms of uh, 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 allowing people to think about uh, education as a modernizing phenomenon, as something that could be uh, adopted and adapted uh, according to one's own needs. Uh, the kind of education that he uh, pushed forward was something that people shunned from before. Uh, in the late 19th century, when he was uh, talking about bringing Islamic curriculum and Western learning together, it was something that nobody had done before. So if he had not emphasized those kind of things, probably many of in this room would not have been educated or you know, in the same fashion. So that's the kind of legacy he has left behind. Now, that's when we think about education and Sayyid Ahmad Khan's contribution, uh, popular perception is mostly related to that and limited to that. Uh, uh, but I think in the book what we do is we present him as the voice of the Indian Muslim. Uh, that he himself writes multiple times in different places as Musalman Hind. So he personifies the idea of Musalman Hind, what the most Indian Muslim is. And then in some ways he also talks about uh, and and uh, he lives through that experience and he shows by example what an Indian Muslim means and should mean. Uh, he uh, viewed all as stakeholders in the society. So when he was founding the Mohammedan Anglo Oriental College uh, in the 1870s, that eventually becomes Aligarh Muslim University in 1920, it was not only for the Muslims. So he basically he, uh, wanted to have an inclusive set of education. And the kind of efforts that went into it. Uh, exhibits that, and we talk about that at length in the book. Uh, various chapters kind of dedicate uh, about what we do uh, in that regard. He uh, is a figure who is rooted in tradition and culture, but also engaged with the Enlightenment thought. So that's something uh, that Sayyid Ahmad Khan is. He is a believer in religion and secularism at the same time. He is uh, in the in awe of Western technology. So especially when he visited London uh, in the 1860s, late 1860s, that's when he came under the impression as to what the Western countries had to offer. And he returns, and he writes about that extensively in his uh, travelogue, about the kind of impressions he had, about what he saw in the West, and he wants to uh, you know, uh, embrace that. But at the same time, he is about keeping his identity. So you know, the kind of modernity that he offers is something that is not uh, Western. He, he offers something that is something different and that uh, people can embody. So basically he challenges the existing notion. So uh, he also, you know, uh, many, there are many critiques about Sayyid Ahmad Khan, including uh, by people like uh, Jamaluddin al-Afghani, the Islamic, uh, noted Islamic thinker in the 19th century, about his being a part of the political, uh, political servitude to the British. But it shows that he's not uh, about that. So we'll, he, his idea uh, of an Indian Muslim is about incorporating different elements within him. His idea is about reaching out to the people. His fundraising for the institution is a uh, testimony to that. He defies uh, the established notions of uh, uh, not uh, dealing with superstition. So he's in some ways, uh, he embodies the spirit of Raja Ram Mohan Roy. Uh, which, you know, there's a lot of writing on Bengal Renaissance, especially Sushupan Sarkar and uh, other scholars who have talked about uh, how uh, 
Bengal Renaissance played a role, but uh, there's no similar work uh, at, uh, at a deeper level that we have noticed with regard to Sayyid Ahmad Khan. So, you know, there, there's an effort to kind of uh, deal with that. What we also find is uh, uh, he is a modernist, uh, like Badiou um, Zaman uh, Nursi uh, of Turkey, who launched the Nurtu movement, which, is, which basically emphasized about incorporating uh, secular education within religious schools and incorporating religious education within secular schools. So it's the kind of spirit that he exhibited. He is uh, in some broad uh, aspect uh, like uh, Muhammad Abdu, uh, the, the rationalist from Egypt. He is a little bit uh, uh, like uh, Rabin Lat Tagore. Uh, he's basically envisioning an institution much before Tagore, but that's the kind of spirit he has. Uh, so he, there's a figure who is all about uh, you know, pushing forward the community uh, but his community is not exclusive. So when he emphasizes, it's, uh, there's, there's a general perception that Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan is mostly about the Muslims of India. But I think what we also push forward in the book is that he is not only about a single community, he is about being Indianness. He has got his interest in uh, the architecture. Uh, he has got his interest in uh, religious scriptures, but at the same time in science and technology. He has got his interest, uh, so he's writing about a variety of these things. So, you know, uh, I do not want to go on and on about that. But there's an original voice in Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan uh, about the Muslim condition in colonial India in the 19th century, but a voice that is not exclusive and confined to a single community. Rather, uh, it is inclusive and it wants to take everyone along. And that's why he was being uh, he was successful in founding the institution in the 1870s. And he envisioned it as a university. Uh, which, of course, did not become a university in his own lifetime, but later onwards, uh, after his death. Uh, so, uh, I think I'll stop here and uh, we'll let others take over. So, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. It's on, on as Kutsia Ahmed said, Jashne Rekta bhi ho rahi hai. And then you have come and you have left your time. Thank you. I am very uh, honoured to be part of this panel and uh, with such a distinguished panel. I am only the facilitator for the conversation. So I will be very, very brief. And uh, uh, briefly, I cannot help but I will just mention this. In an age when Muslims are the target of mobilisation, when Muslims are on everybody's mind, then for the Cambridge University Press to bring out the second volume of ideas, of political ideas on Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan is, uh, is I think both courageous and remarkably brave and uh, well I think it's great that you've done that because everybody does Gandhi. My, uh, my daughter who is in second year college has a paper on Gandhi and she said Mama I have read Mahatma Gandhi since I was in class 6. But I have not really read anything that Ambedkar wrote as yet. I just know that he was the father of the constitution. So I'm just po pointing out gaps in uh, education. So this is one of the uh, one of the things that struck me. Uh, so I only got the book yesterday. I got a chance to glance through it and to read the first chapter. So briefly from, but my association with Aligarh goes on to the extent that some member of my family or the other has always been employed there. <laughs> you know, Aligarh gave jobs to lots of people I was related to. First cousin, second cousins, third cousins. Nokri dhunni bhai, Aligarh mein ho sakta hai, umeed hai, mil jai gai. Mil li gai, kaafi logo ko mil gai. Admission nahi mila, toh hum bhi Uttar Pradesh ke musulman khandan se hai. And uh, Aligarh mein ja ke, naukri mil gai, Aligarh mein admission mil gaya. Aur uh, tisri baad, my own grandfather, since I am a Uttar Pradesh Muslim in sort of a way, even though I am now here very much so, my grandfather was a, a lawyer in Lucknow with a small land holding in Awadh. And when, he, when it came to the question of educating his children, I think Sir Sayyid must have played on his mind because he decided to send only the boys to English medium schools. The, uh, the girls were sent to Urdu medium schools. It's very interesting. 
the, by the time, and there were seven children, like good Muslims, there were lots of children. So I hope there's no Hindutva agitation is over here. There were seven, eight of them, one of them passed away. So four boys were sent, English medium for the first time, La Martina. Ladkiyo ko anone bheja, Urdu kisi chote chote school mein. By the time the last sister was born, then she was finally sent to an English medium. So some progress was made, you know, along the way. And uh, anyway, I found, as I glanced at the book just to make an introduction, uh, I found this fascinating account of a conversation between him and Mirza Ghalib. When he is mourning, when Sir Sayyid is mourning the end of the Mughal Empire, and he is translating any Akbari, and he goes to Ghalib to write a foreword. And Ghalib says, I will write Farsi and that is also criticism. Because this is the time of the Mughal Empire. Now you keep looking at Calcutta, because from there the world will come from there, the constitution of the world. He is referring to the British coming there. So may I advise you that since Mirza Ghalib was a visionary, maybe you can bring out the next book on him. He was guiding Sir Sayyid on what would be the accurate political direction that the world will take. At this point, to revisit somebody who was a social reformer, who, Bumi, who was traditional but modern, is of great importance to all of us, is critical to, to remember a figure like Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan. Uh, I don't know whether Aligarh lives up to everything that he may have imagined. I go there frequently. Last year also I had occasion to go. Things are not perfect over there. Like I've said, what it does do, it gives uh, people a chance to get a certain education from a particular community and besides giving lots of jobs to some of them who happen to be related to me. Let us now move on to the, you know, to the larger discussion which would be between this very distinguished panel. So may I invite okay, uh, Professor uh, Rajmohan Gandhi to please uh, enlighten us on your thoughts on this book and Sir Sayyid. Sir, would you like to go there? Yeah, let me try and speak from here. Am I being heard? Yes. 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 Uh, am I being heard because of the mic or inside of it? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think the mic is working, but then you know, I want to consult some notes, so I want my hand free. Uh, I thought I would make four broad points. One is that uh, Delhi is as much Sayyid's place as Aligarh is. Delhi is as much Sayyid's place as Aligarh is. Uh, his home was destroyed during 1857. He wrote about historical monuments here. Uh, and he he won for uh, the Muslim community of India this enormous place. Uh, and he restored the relationship between this very powerful British rule in India and uh, the Muslim community. It's a historic achievement. And so, uh, so let us recognize that Delhi is very much Sir Sayyid's place. Uh, for my second point, I want to go to the United Kingdom, uh, Cambridge, uh, with, uh, with which this book is connected. I'm very interested that we all know of uh, various problems the UK has, different minorities have in the UK. But there's also this reality that many Muslims feel very free in the United Kingdom, Kingdom today. Uh, many Muslims feel free to practice their religion even in a conservative form if they wish to practice it that way, or in a non-conservative form, a progressive form. It is very interesting to see uh, wonderful British cricketers with orthodox Muslim beards. Uh, so uh, I asked myself, how has this happened? And I don't have an analytical answer to my question, but I, my gut feeling is that in this development, Sir Sayyid has played a very large part. Uh, now, we've heard of some of his astonishing achievements in so many fields. My goodness, in so many fields. He, he founds this incredible institution. He restores the relationship of the Muslims of India with the British government. Uh, he, he writes an incredible commentary on the Quran. 
uh, he's a reformer, courageous reformer, and more and more and more. But since I'm a student of history, I'm very interested in his role as a historian and a journalist. And I want you to listen to this. Uh, you all know, of course, about his uh, work on the monuments of, uh, of, of Delhi. Some of his monuments got destroyed uh, in 1857. So, but for his uh, account, we wouldn't even know of them. Um, and then there is his history of 1857 in Bijnor, which also many of you would have read. An amazing contemporary account of what happened in 1857. Now, many books have been written about 1857 by many British people. Very, 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 very few accounts written at that time by Indians about 1857. And one of those few accounts is of Sir Sayyid Ahmed. So when he writes about the Bijnor, most of you are familiar with it. But I thought I would mention two aspects of his report of the Bijnor Rebellion, which will uh, reveal his meticulousness as a scholar and a historian. This was an endorsement of what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> so he writes in his account of the revolt in Bijnor, he gives the name of six he gives the names of sixty-two British and Indian employees of the district administration. He's writing an account of what happened to them, and he gives the names of sixty-two of those people. There is the magistrate uh, Alexander Shakespeare, the joint magistrate. There's a surgeon, Dr. Knight, and then there are Tehsil Lars. He gives the name of the doctor, a Bengali Hindu called Tara Chandra Sen, an Indian clerk, another Bengali Hindu, Babu Kalichar, and there are other clerks or writers, and others working in the district's treasury, police, jails, or school inspectors. So he gives a very thorough account, giving these names. And then when he writes about the destruction that took place, uh, this is what he writes. Uh, the by now excited villagers next attacked the court building, the Kachari, to loot the English reference books and the volumes of survey maps. They looted whatever could be looted after patching had been thrown inside. The collectorate and criminal courts were set alight and set on fire. Miscellaneous bundles from other rooms were taken out one after another to be thrown on this burning fire. The roof of some burning rooms of the Kachari fell in. The neat offices of the criminal court, the collector, the Sadat Amini, and the registrar of these, all of whose files had just been arranged alphabetically, were thus turned into ashes. So his very deep sadness is about the destruction of these files and these documents and these records. <coughs> so I wanted to mention this to give you an idea of the meticulousness of, of this man. Um, now the last point, my last point about him. Um, so uh, today, uh, yes, the Muslim world all over the world faces great challenges. Sometimes it faces uh, great persecution, discrimination, dislike, Islamophobia. Uh, of course, there are other groups also that face this. Uh, the Mexicans. Who in the United States, the Hindus in the United States, the Sikhs in the United States, the Jews in the United States, and many groups that, that face this, of course, the African Americans, the Native Americans. Um, but yes, there is in, in definitely this very strong uh, challenge that the Muslim communities of the world do face. Now, Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan faced something like that in the years just after 1857. And he said he was going to do something about it. He took responsibility for it. And what an incredible feat he did accomplish. So it's one thing for us to recognize the challenge and to bemoan it, uh, to have negative thoughts about those who, uh, who like these fires of dislike, malice, ill will. But then some people have to say, well, we, I will do something about it. And this is something that 
uh, is, is a, something, a reflection for all of us, that if you're faced with a challenge, what is our, our response? And now, this country too is, faces many things. In the last three or four days, I think there's a little improvement. Uh, <laughs> uh, people are free now to laugh, to smile, uh, to rejoice. Uh, so, but still a huge amount of, of work needs to be done. But I do wish to thank uh, all of you who have produced this wonderful book so that we can take inspiration for this, from this astonishing figure, Sir Sayyid Ahmed. Thank you so much, uh, Rajmohan Gandhi. Now, I've been tasked with asking, uh, with provoking Professor Bose into saying something because I believe he was not ready to, to speak on the stump. So, can I pro should I ask you a provocative question, sir, or would you just like to? Yes, uh, sir. But, uh, <laughs> but shouldn't someone who's more prepared to speak about the book speak first and then I'll come in? You want to come in last? I'll okay, in last. okay, sure. Because, so, because right. Mohanji had notes. Uh, she is uh, right. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, so I'll okay. So, Dr. 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 would you yeah. just and you go can ahead? Ask me as then then yes, I I would definitely like to provoke you into yeah. saying right. things which are not polite. You know? <laughs> So first of all, thank you very much for, is it, am I heard properly? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to read and this book and to engage with it. I think it fulfills two very important objectives. The first one, which we have already mentioned, is to, re to give renewed visibility to Sir Syed, who despite his very important uh, role in educational and social reform, is unfortunately very often neglected in the grand narratives of, Indian, uh, of modern Indian history. And so, maybe because of his being Muslim, he's often put in a narrow category of Muslim reformer, as if he was only relevant to Muslims alone. So what this book does very well is precisely to you know, give renewed centrality and visibility to this um, character, and of course in the present political context, it is something particularly important. The second objective that this book fulfills very well is to explore the multiple facets of this character and of his contributions. Because, we, of course, we all know of Sir Syed's contribution to AMU, to Aligarh. So he's known as an institutional, in, institution builder. Um, but some of us may not know so much about how prolific a scholar he was uh, as a history, with a strong interest in history, in archaeology, in science, technology, religion, etc something that Professor Gandhi has just uh, mentioned earlier, so I won't go into the details of that. And what this collection of articles does particularly well is to locate these multiple contributions in a larger Indian and global context. So here it's important to bear in mind that the, the series, the companion series, is not just about Indian political thinkers, it's about global thinkers. And um, what this book does is precisely to locate Sir Syed's contribution in an Indian and global context. So, for example, uh, Raisul Rahman, in, one of, in, in his article, looks at the close inner circle of Sir Syed's associates as well as of his opponents, like the Ugandi ulema, pan-Islamist figures like Anavani, whom you just mentioned earlier. Of course, several articles show how much the 1857 rebellion and the fall of the Mughal Empire was a rupture, constituted a rupture for Sir Syed. I think it's Yasmin Sakya who talks about how it was the greatest watershed in Sir Syed's life, uh, which urged him to adapt um, to the new political setup and to engage with scientific knowledge and modern education to ensure the progress of his calm. In addition to that, several articles highlight the impact of the foundation of Congress, something that we should not, of course, um, overlook, because for Sir Syed, it was very much a challenge um, that he had to tackle, um, as he saw it as a potential threat to his efforts to create greater proximity between Muslim elites and British authorities. Now, outside India, the articles, of course, uh, speak of the influence that Britain may have on Sir Syed. Of course, there was his famous trip to England. There's also the fact that he engaged with many Western scientific ideas, including that, um, the, you know, the theory of evolution by Darwin, something that personally I was not familiar with. 
Um, but it, very interestingly, many articles also highlight Cersei's relation to the rest of the Muslim world um, and highlight the similarities between Cersei's project and that of Muslim reformers elsewhere, for example, in the Ottoman Empire, in Egypt, um, you know, with reformers like Mohammed Abdu, who advocated the revival of Arabic sciences and argued that science and Islam were compatible. Um, these articles also highlight the differences that Sir Said may have had with some of these reformers, particularly his opposition to pan-Islamism and the fact that he chose to collaborate with the British authorities rather than oppose them directly. So basically through the study of Sir Said's multifaceted persona, what this collection of articles does very well is to draw a fascinating picture of the period, again, not just in India, but in, in the world. So, uh, a picture that is neither India-focused or purely imperial history, but is a much more, uh, basically is a, shows a much more complex, connected history um, of the period. Now, personally, what I thought was particularly interesting in this collection of articles was the very subtle analysis of Sir Said's engagement with Western uh, ideas of modernity. Um, Several articles, especially that of David Lelyveld, Charles Ramsey, and Sarah Kidvai, show that Sir Said did not simply import Western ideas of progress in science. Um, he was also very familiar with a rich tradition of Islamic science and technology, which itself reached, was reaching back to Aristotle. And so, as David, David Lelyveld um, you know, notes, his notion of progress did not need to come from enlightenment, or from Victorian science, it was also largely shaped by um, other Muslim intellectual traditions or Muslim um, scholars like Shabaliullah, for example, whose notion of irtifakat, so the stages of human advancement, largely shaped Sir Said's notion of progress. Similarly, Sir Said's views on evolution were influenced not just by Darwin, but also bore many similarities with that of earlier Muslim authors like Ibn Khaldun, the famous North African Muslim scholar of the 14th century, who saw humans as a higher form of animal originating uh, from more evolved monkeys. So this is a very good example of how a connected history focused on one individual and his multiple sources of inspiration can help us challenge the otherwise usually Eurocentric discourse on modernity. It shows how ideas that we associate with modernity did not stem from Europe alone, but also from a long-term engagement with earlier intellectual tradition, including those present in the Muslim world, and which themselves could be inspired by Greek philosophical and scientific legacies. <clears throat> Do I have two more minutes? Yeah. Yeah, sure, sorry. <laughs> Just two more. Yeah. Uh, another aspect that I particularly appreciated in this volume is the fact that these articles do not shy away from highlighting the ambiguities of Sir Said, a very complex, multi-layered personality. So he's not, a monolithic, he's not a monolithic icon to be either worshipped or rejected. For example, um, regarding his position on women's education, something that you, um, you know, uh, maybe pointed to, Guy Minot shows how, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> shows that Sir Said was not necessarily opposed to uh, women's education, but clearly that was not his priority. Um, as long as the state of Indian men was in need of reform, the state of Indian women was a matter for later consideration for him. Um, and at the same time, what we see is that the Aligarh movement, which of course originated with Sir Said, produced a very lively debate on women's education and later ended up with the creation of girls' schools, women's magazines, and the publication of books for women. So, a complex legacy regarding women's education, similarly when it comes to uh, his definition of the calm, you know, his interpretation of the calm could vary. At times it could come to uh, include Hindus and Muslims living in India, sometimes it was Muslims alone, very often it was primarily the Muslim Ashraf. And so here we can, also, of course, you know, we cannot deny that there may have been a certain elitist streak in some of his uh, writing and discourses that again these articles very rightly um, Highlight. Um, yeah, I think I just, okay. can just end with this and maybe say a few more words later. But I just, if I may just um, end with one uh, sentence. I think that 
um, if Sir Sai's legacy is still relevant today, it's not because of because you know what he has said is uh, you know is all that it has to be said and can be transposed directly in the present context. Sir Sai was very much a man of his own times with his own biases, um, and I think that this volume's most precious contribution is to help us understand Sir Sai's own filters, so that we make so that we may contextualize better the questions that he raised and the solutions that he proposed to reinterpret them in the present context. Thank you so much, uh, You started off making the point that he's, uh, Sir Sayyid is always put into the pigeonhole of being a Muslim social reformer. I think that's a very valid point. And we, we had a little discussion about Aligarh earlier, but uh, Last year, one of the most influential films that happened to be made in India was a film called Mulk, which, which I don't know how many people here have seen it. And it turned out, because the director and the man who wrote it, it's a, it's a, a man called Anubhav Sinha, he contacted me because I wrote something. He is also a graduate of Aligarh Muslim University. So I just thought I'd mention that. I was surprised because he had the nuance of of Uttar Pradesh and communal mobilization so right that uh, he, he, so you have uh, to see it only as a, you know, there may be a preponderance of Muslims, but I just wanted to make that point. And now I'm going to finally get my chance to hopefully provoke Professor Bose into saying, uh, <laughs> Professor Bose, the, the whole reconciliation, Sir Sayyid, uh, the, he sees the Mughal Empire disintegrate and uh, he is from a certain background, and then he goes and makes, he, he thinks it's very important to make peace with the British, to understand them, and would you sort of give me your take on the whole process? Can he be judged? Is it, are you just going to say wonderful things about Sir Sayyid? Are you going to criticize him at all? I wait for your answer. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for having me here, and at the outset, let me congratulate uh, Yasmin and Rice for editing this uh, wonderful volume. Uh, what the book does uh, is to uh, illuminate uh, different facets of uh, Sayyid Ahmad Khan's uh, life and thought. Uh, but perhaps what uh, you know, I can do in trying to answer your question is to uh, uh, you know, place uh, Sayyid Ahmad Khan in the context of uh, recent uh, and quite sophisticated uh, uh, historiographical developments uh, uh, in the field of history of, uh, of ideas. Now, it goes without question that uh, Sayyid Ahmad Khan was a towering intellectual figure of the late 19th century, and uh, he made the most profound contributions to ethical discourses in that period. Uh, he was also a great institution builder. You know, Aligarh is a standing monument uh, uh, to his, uh, uh, to his uh, abilities. But I think that um, um, the most significant contribution that he made was to uh, reconfigure uh, the relationship between the religious and the secular in Islam. It is sometimes too easily assumed that the two domains are inextricably enmeshed. Uh, but uh, what um, Sayyid Ahmad Khan was able to do was to provide a very fine insight into the balance between the realms of Deen and Dunya. And uh, here I'm drawing uh, from a section uh, on jihad and ethics in modernist Muslim thought in uh, Aisha Jalal's book, Partisans of, uh, of Allah, where she says that Sayyid Ahmad Khan once commented that deen and dunya had a strange relationship. Leaving religion does not result in leaving the world, but leaving the world does result in leaving religion. This is worship. This is religion, deen, and faith, iman, when human beings help human beings in the world. And uh, I think um, 
I will address directly, I think, what you were hinting at in trying to provoke me, the whole question of loyalism. And that, I think, is uh, dealt with, um, you know, quite well in the essays in this volume, but also in a lot of new literature that has come out on, on Sayyid Ahmad Khan. Um, now, there were, of course, Muslim rebels in 1857. There were those like Sayyid Ahmad Khan who were critical of the rebellion. Uh, he did not want to uh, describe uh, the 1857 revolt as a jihad. Uh, he was at one with uh, many other Muslim thinkers who were very pragmatic and felt a jihad should only be proclaimed when success could reasonably be achieved. Uh, you don't uh, dignify a failed rebellion with the, uh, with the appellation uh, of, uh, of jihad. And then, of course, as Raj Mohanji has mentioned, he tried to bring about uh, an accommodation, some kind of a reconciliation between the empirical fact of British supremacy under Crown Raj and the Muslim community, particularly of, uh, of North India. But if Sayyid Ahmad Khan was a loyalist, so were a whole range of other figures in that period. Um, you know, there were different religious communities who were vying to be more loyal to the British Raj in the late 19th century. Uh, it could be um, argued that the early Indian National Congress was also loyalist. You know, the Congress uh, and other nationalist leaders, both Hindu and Muslim, began to consider the possibility of the severance of the British connection only from the early 20th century onwards, not inside Ahmad Khan's lifetime. So I think you know, that needs to be underscored. Also, um, you know, I think the, the contrast between Jamaluddin al-Afghani and Saeed Ahmad Khan is sometimes exaggerated. Um, of course, they took a very different stance politically. You know, if there was one consistency in al-Afghani's thought and action, it was that he was implacably opposed to British imperial domination. Uh, while, you know, Sayyid Ahmad Khan took a, a, you know, a different line. But where they were at one was in refusing to make any distinction between European science and Muslim science. And both were able to draw on the Islamic tradition of, of science while engaging with you know, modern ideas about science emanating from the West. But what I will say about Sayyid Ahmad Khan, that if, if I were to be somewhat critical, is that he took his loyalism a little too far and he carried it on for a little too long. And I say that because even one of his closest compatriots, Shibli Nomani, uh, decided to break with him in 1894 when he established the Nagwatul Ulama, Nomani could see what was happening in a new phase of European imperialist aggression against the Muslim world. Uh, but Sayyid Ahmad Khan, until the end of his life, didn't make that shift. Uh, and, you know, perhaps one can understand why Nomani was able to change course and Sayyid Ahmad Khan didn't. Sayyid Ahmad Khan had traveled to the West in 1869. You know, there was this, uh, and he has left beautiful accounts of his uh, journey on the ship uh, Baroda. Uh, and here I must also point out that while he did not accept the temporal authority of the Ottoman Sultan Caliph, he said that Muslims should be pragmatic here and accept the temporal authority of the British, so long as Muslims uh, were able to practice their religion. Okay. But that does not mean that Sayyid Ahmad Khan did not share in a kind of a, an Islamic universalist aspiration. You know, when he sees the Hejaz, he's absolutely thrilled. You know, uh, this is the, the the land which is blessed. He's saying right. so. So he has that conception of a of a larger, uh, you know, Balade uh, Balade Islam. 
But Nomani travelled to the West. Again, it was a sea voyage with Thomas Arnold uh, in 1892. And so he saw for himself what was happening with a new phase of European imperialism. And that led him to shift course. But having said that, I just want to uh, also point out one great contribution of Sayyid Ahmad Khan was his ability to inspire other Muslim scholars and intellectuals to do great work. And I'll just mention two. One is, of course, uh, Masad Dase Hali. You know, in 1879, Hali uh, composed his sort of magnum opus, and it was inspired by Sayyid Ahmad Khan, but also Sayyid Ahmad Khan recognized uh, its uh, great merits. The other is that, you know, Sayyid Ahmad Khan needs to be seen in the context of a prosopography of a number of very great Muslim intellectuals of that period. Uh, there was Chirag Ali, Maulavi Chirag Ali from Hyderabad, uh, Sayyid Amir Ali uh, from uh, Orisha originally, but then sort of Calcutta. All of them began by, you know, writing you know, biographies of the Prophet because they had to contest uh, ill-informed European denunciations of the Prophet by William Muir, Muir for example. Or later on, you know, Hunter's denunciations and so forth. The second work that um, Sayyid Ahmad Khan inspired was by Shibli Nomani, his Sirat al Nabi, you know, the, 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 the life of the Prophet, which in fact turned out to be a posthumous tribute to Sayyid Ahmad Khan because it was such a you know, great piece of work. So I think that he was a complex figure, but he is extremely important today uh, because of. Uh, uh, because of the way that he actually uh, became uh, became one of the most articulate exponents of you know enlightened thought right. in the in, in the most capacious meaning of that phrase in late nineteenth century. Thank you so much, Professor, for that brilliant. Uh, Jasmine, as the author, can I draw you back to respond? And also, I have my own question to you. As a former legal, uh, student of, uh, of AMU, how do you respond to how AMU is today? Very briefly. And you could sort of also pick on some, get to some of the ideas which have been uh, mentioned by our distinguished panelists. Thank you. I don't think I need a mic because I'm a teacher and I have <coughs> lots of students in the classroom. Um, as an Alec, I went to school from 1980 to 1986. I started in class 11. So my very early training is from Aligarh. And from Aligarh, I went to the United States and did my MA again and a PhD. So I am, uh, I am an Alig with a, a bit of an American kind of degree. What does Aligarh mean to me? 30 years later, to come back and do a book like this, you can understand Aligarh, Sir Sayed, my friends, my teachers have lived with me all throughout the period that I have journeyed westward. And like Sir Sayed, as Shukarada mentioned, his journey to the west opened his mind to see that education, his value, is not confined <laughs> to a tiny little community or a tiny little period of time. It is expansive, it's capacious. These are horizons of possibility. What was the most important thing I took from Aligarh is today I'm a peace professor. I'm a professor of history and I hold what they call a distinguished chair in peace studies. How did I become a peace professor? It's from Aligarh. It is in Abdullah Hall that I learned the ethics of living with others, living in harmony, and actually seeing that friendship is not only with people of your generation or your community, but friendship is with all kinds of people and all ranges of possible classes and even genders, right? And I wrote a long essay about friendship in Abdullah Hall and how that is the location of peace. So I take those kind of ethical lessons, not as, you know, not lessons in the punitive sense, but lessons in the way that it allows you to become a better human being and contribute to the human journey comes from Aligarh. What has become Aligarh today? As I said in my opening remark, <coughs> Aligarh continues to inspire many, many of us. A lot of our alumni are here from Aligarh, and we all get together over and over again thinking about Sir Sayed's mission and what can we do. Of course, we are not doing, as you said, Sabah, even a tiny bit of it. 
When you go to Aligar, sometimes you are despondent, you despair. And then I think about Sir Sayyid, when he was despairing, he actually found new possibilities. He did not see it as a moment of gloom and doom, rather he sees it as a moment of sort of forging something in the future. So I, I'm seeing Aligarh is going to a hiatus. It hopefully will become more confident, it will take Sir Sayyid's lesson in a meaningful way to sort of build a confidence and claim its place in India. As you said, Musulman e Hind and the Ganga Jamuna Tehzeeb that Aligarh sort of emphasized and Sir Sayyid emphasized is very much part of what it means to be Indian and what it means to be Indian Muslim. It's not simply getting a degree and getting a job. It's actually learning to be not just a good citizen, but to be a good human being, which Aligarh continues to prosper and, and grow, I think, in those directions. So I'm still a I'm not a fan club, right? Okay, I'm you're, not you're, a, you're, <laughs> you're sentimental and optimistic and and you only have lovely memories. Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> and you know, and uh, Rachel, can I sort of get you to respond to any of the points that Professor uh, Bukos and uh, So I think uh, I, I agree with all the points that uh, you've presented. And I think uh, what you've said with regard to uh, Shibli Numani as to how he kind of, in, in a way, turns back right through the writing of Siratul uh, the Sirat of the Prophet uh, as a tribute. Uh, the, I think we have to also look at uh, Sayyid Ahmad Khan in his own time, so late 19th century. And a lot of the popular understanding of Sayyid Ahmad Khan is mostly because we try to fit this 19th century figure and try to assess him from the current 21st century lens. And I think that's something that's, uh, we, we, I think, we, uh, it's, it's not a response to your point, but just to emphasize. Uh, what what you said is that many of the things that developed later on. So, for uh, for example, there are many critiques about him. Right? Why did he not promote women's education as much in his own lifetime? He uh, his ideas were very very clear. Once he set his eyes on the project of the foundation of the college, he is uh, really emphatic about that as a single mission. Right, and everything is oriented around that. Uh, it's about founding the college. It's about <coughs> fundraising. His uh, keeping up uh, late in the night, he's going around the country. He's actually, he also goes to the public events with a bowl and posing himself as a beggar to fundraise. So he's, he's got a single point perspective and, and a project in his mind and he does that. Um, many of the things he's not very ready, very much ready in his own lifetime. So uh, with regard to women's education, he says, and since you raised that point earlier, uh, he uh, says that it's uh, it's more important that education is spread in the community and that the social and economic standing of the community needs to be put on its own feet and then it would make sense to engage in greater education for the women right so in, in fact he writes and Gail Miller writes that beautifully in her chapter uh, that uh, asking for I, I think the, the other argument that if you educate the women first then uh, it's good for the community because then there will be better citizens in the society. He says it's the chicken and the egg argument. And, and of course, he's, uh, you know, he's coming from his own uh, 19th century uh, time period. But he says that it's important that uh, once uh, the social and economic standing of the community is better, then they will be able to provide enough resources for the women to educate. He is, of course, not a big proponent of that at, in his own time. But later on, uh, People who pick up uh, the cause of education, such as uh, Muhammad Abdullah, who founds the uh, Women's College in Aligarh, is basically is ins getting his inspiration from the overall idea of the project of education from Sir Sayyid. Thank you so much. And I have a question of my own. And I think I'll, Yasmin could answer it, but I'm going to ask Professor Gandhi this. I've never understood because I made a few trips to Aligarh. And I said, a lot of members, family members are employed there. But last year I got occasion, I was invited by the students' union there with others. And I noted, and I was reminded of the fact that every event there starts with some Quranic uh, recitation from the Quran. I was, I wonder why that is indeed so, and should it be so? And I, I checked, it's an old tradition, they, they do so in Aligarh. So I have a question about that. That is, so uh, Professor Gandhi and uh, Yasmin, can you explain it to me? I never understood it. Uh, so. Thank you. Um, I'll just tell it anecdotally, okay? Yeah, today, I think, um, you, as you mentioned, Sabah, that Muslims of India today are in a state of 
uncertainty, they're very anxious, and when anx what happens when anxiety takes over, people turn to familiar spaces. And of course, the recitation of Quran becomes one of the... But I believe spaces. that's always been so. I yes. checked. So okay. why is that so? There's, that's my question. I don't know what was happening in Sir Sayyid's time, but one, there's one little incident that's very interesting. The Sir Sayyid always insisted that people should do their religious practices. Hindus should have the Hindu religious practices. Muslims should have the Muslim religious practices. And so there was once a Jamaat doing, uh, they saw Sir Sayyid coming, and the students had not yet said their prayers. So then they saw Sir Sayyid coming, and they quickly sort of assembled and wanted to do their prayers. And then one of them was saying, Burha Chalagya, and he said, Burha Yahabi, what do there? So you know, he was very much part of this thing that religious education is very important, but it should not be forced and enforced. The question that you're raising is, why do they do it? Is a question. That is it coming from the fact that people want to invoke the blessings of a higher authority as they take the, uh, the step forward? Or is it doing because there's an anxiety to establish an identity? That's a different kind, and that sort of probably has to be answered by the Aligarians who are here. There's several of them sitting right here, and who can probably tell us why it happens in every ceremony. So one can take a very, very different position on that. And Ijaz was the vice president of the union, so he can probably tell us why it happens. We, we, should we just get a few points and then we'll get to the guests? I don't know how much time do we have. Could, yeah. Chair, should I? Where, you indicate to me when you want question answers. We have 20 minutes. So, so we'll give 10 minutes. So maybe I'll bring you in then and then we can just get uh, Professor Gandhi but we, from. But we also end, don't yeah. forget, we start with the Quran, but we end with the Tarana. No alligator function can right, end right. without the Tarana. The tarana right. And the Tarana is the thing that pulls us all together as a community. So we may start with some religion, but ultimately we say we are all secular. <coughs> and we are the new, you know, this is our garden from where we sort of move forward. Right. Uh, okay, but I was, I was there with a mixed uh, sort of panelists, left, right, everything. And many, most of them were non-Muslims, so it was noted. And, uh, you know, so I'm just making that point. It, it was noted by others that why is the university starting with reading from the Quran? So I just thought it's a point worth making. And so let me just get the concluding remarks on uh, Sir Sayyid by all our, uh, Professor Gandhi, would you sort of just... I guess I'll try. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to imagine what Sir Sayyid would say if he were around today. In his time, he was a realist, and he knew that the British power was there, it was a strong one. And so reconciliation with the British power was a paramount necessity. What would he say today in today's India, in today's world? So here's my guess. Of course, it's a guess. I think he would say that every Indian, whether it's a male or a female, uh, Muslim or Hindu or <coughs> agnostic or atheist, Sikh, Parsi, Jew, uh, Christian, Buddhist. Um, I think he, he would say that you should ask yourself in your heart a question, who are your people? And then he would say, I hope your answer would be that everybody in India is your people. This is my uh, my guess as to what Sir Sayyid might say today, because he was a man who understood his time and the need of his time. And when we have more Hindus and more Muslims, more women and more men willing to say that every single person in this <coughs> land is my person, is my people. We will be on to the new age. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gandhi. I think the problem that many Muslims would feel is that they're ready to say that, but others are not willing to say that about them. So that is in that lies the, the really... Uh, yeah, and Sir Sayyid never said, I will only do something if others also are willing to do it. <laughs> okay. Uh, We have to recognize that, like everyone else, Sayyid Ahmad Khan had multiple identities. Of course, he, he was a Muslim, he was an Indian, he was an Indian Muslim, Musulman Hind. But we also have to take note of his regional identity. When he 
spoke about Hindustan. He was often thinking about northern India. In fact, uh, some of his concerns were really about the more advanced Bengali nation to the east, which had acquired uh, Western education before the others uh, in the rest of uh, India. Um, he uh, also had a class identity. He was an Ashraf. Uh, he had a gender identity, uh, which probably you know, contributes to his limitations in terms of women's education. He was in favor of women's education, but he wanted religious education imparted within the confines of the Muslim home, at least in the context of mid to late, uh, late uh, 19th century uh, India. Uh, but, you know, where he, he was a real master was in his way in which he could argue his case. And uh, he has been misunderstood uh, by, a, by a historian who has uh, a very powerful uh, critique of the gentleman of Aligarh, led by uh, Sayyid Ahmad Khan, uh, and uh, who uh, sees uh, Sayyid Ahmad Khan's modernity as a kind of an apologetic modernity. But I think here there is a confusion of categories that is taking place. Apologetics was a mode of argumentation. You know, drawing from the Greek etymology, what it meant was a reasoned, re written defense of one's opinion. And that is what Sayyid Ahmad Khan was doing when he was refuting Muir or Hunter and so on. The confusion of categories comes when one simply thinks about apology in the commonsensical English sense from the 16th century onwards, as if, as if it's a apologia you know, a kind of sorry uh, modernity. That was not what Sayyid Ahmad Khan uh, was all about. There was something that was assertive about what, uh, what, he, was, uh, what he was saying. And uh, I think that Muslims in India today have a lot to learn from Sayyid Ahmad Khan, both in terms of the, his mode of argumentation, but also his ability to draw on a deep Islamic intellectual tradition, even while you know engaging with the contemporary West. Thank you so much, Lawrence. I'll be very brief this time. Um, in the, in this volume, you introduce a very important notion, which is that of friendship, and you suggest that friendship can also play a role in community building. And I think while we often tend to think of community as based primarily upon a shared identity or shared interests, it could be interesting to think of building community on the basis of overlapping friendships. Thank you. That's, that's, that's a lovely thought. And uh, would the authors like to have a few last words before I open it to questions? Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, for me, Sayyid Ahmad Khan is about coming out of a crisis. So when he was living in the mid-19th century, he, India is facing this immense crisis politically. So he's, he's basically analyzing that deeply intellectually and politically <laughs> in his writings. And he's basically thinking about a way of coming out of that crisis. So you know, that makes him far more relevant in our times than I Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. And Yasmin, I'll give you the last before we actually, hopefully, we'll have some questions and some answers about Aligarh too. Yeah, I think I would means for many of us who are from a leader, Sir Sayyid is not simply a figure that we read in a book. We live with that kind of um, of, of that uh, mission of what does uh, what does it mean to be an educated person of a particular kind, and what uh, Shubhada Da mentioned out here that you know his ideas were so capacious that it is hard to put it in one box, and one has to sort of uh, one has to be able to look at Sir Sayyid both for what he contributed, but what are questions that he has actually opened up for future generations to think about, crisis being one of them, identity being other ways, what does it mean to live in harmony with a variety of different kinds of people. So it's not simply the tiny little project of building an institution, but the, institu uh, the building of the mind that he, pro uh, that he sort of lays the foundation for us to think about. In this day and age, I think it has become very, very important to think about how the humanities can enable this kind of critical thinking that Sir Sayyid, I think, from, the, from an Indian standpoint, was one of the original thinkers of the question of <coughs> the humanities actually creating a new kind of person who's refined and at the same time is looking forward to contribute in a very constructive way by, by helping himself and then helping the entire community. 
So that's what I take out of it. Thank you. And let's, I think I was going to get an answer about it. And then some questions. Uh, my name is Ajaz Nagpur. I'm a lawyer in the Supreme Court and I am also an alumnus of Marigar Muslim University. I take this opportunity to congratulate uh, Yasmin, whom we call her Moni, and uh, Professor Rais, who have edited this book. Uh, one question is Sabha. Let me just give you a background that we, there is a large number of Aligar alumni, most actually we call them old boys. The women may take objection to it because we can't, they can't call them old girls. So uh, they spread all over the world. And you know, Sir Sayyid, uh, when he started this institution, actually he was doing it for the Muslim community and he wanted the Muslim community who were really in a very bad shape after that uh, when the Britishers came. So he wanted an institution with the religious background and with her modern education. In fact, and let me tell you, we had one of the <coughs> most secular institutions. He, he used to say that India mein Hindu or Musliman a khubsurat dulhan ki do aankhe hai. You know, there are two eyes of a bride and unless they live together, they, this country cannot uh, this thing. And as far as uh, this uh, reciting of Quran, it is not something anti-secular or something because we also have a huge a tarana which is written by Majaz and on many occasions when heads of state or other people, we also have the national anthem being played in on many occasions. But you know, my question to the authors actually is apart from that, there is, uh, you know, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan uh, started this institution. Mira, I, what I thought was, but there is no other institution or university where the Muslim community have been able to, uh, uh, to establish after. And we always look to the today's Muslim population of 15 crores or 20 crores cannot be an answer, cannot, be, cannot give this education to the Muslims all over the country. And why has this happened? Can you, uh, as authors, would you be able to reflect on this? That Muslim community has not been able to generate that kind of mission that Sir Sayyid told us to do that as Aligarh Muslim University alumni also we have failed. So would you like to reflect on why has okay. this happened? Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions and we'll take it all at one time. Yeah. Oh, okay. Since you raised, uh, my name is Asim Siddiqui and uh, I teach at Aligarh Muslim okay. University. Just two very brief observations. Uh, one, uh, you raised the question about loyalism. Uh, what I can say is that uh, when Sir Sikhin wrote uh, uh, his uh, analysis of the causes of the revolt of 1857 and many of the things that he wrote there, he advocated uh, greater participation of Indians and uh, better relationship between Indians and uh, of course Indians treated, uh, being treated with more dignity. That means many of those things that uh, he identified. Later uh, when uh, Congress was formed, Initial demands of the Congress were almost the same which Sir Sayyid identified in his analysis of the revolt of 1857. So that means uh, that uh, issue of loyalism, and as Sir pointed out, that uh, Congress was also loyalist. Yeah. Yeah, it's and second thing is just very brief. I'm not very sure uh, whether uh, this entire convention of beginning program with recitation, it is a very old convention. Uh, I mean, uh, I may be wrong here, but probably it started uh, maybe in late 60s or something. Right. So it's not that it has always been there. Yeah. Right, okay. I respond to it as someone living now, because I don't want to start, in the future, have Saraswati Vandana starting anything. So that's my cautionary. Yeah, so but, uh, do we answer, yeah, would you like to answer the question? I'll take some more, please. Uh, my question is related to the comment Professor Raisul Rahman made about uh, Sir Sayyid personifying the Indian Muslim, but uh, anyone could answer it. Uh, given that we are now finally beginning to have a conversation on upper caste and lower caste Muslims, uh, is it possible or even desirable that uh, one person or class of persons should or even could personify the Indian Muslim? I think uh, let's answer these two questions. And why, why no more institutions? And can, I mean, is Sir Sayyid also, are we still continuing with a lot of elites presuming to speak for Muslims? I think those are good questions, so let's... You take the second one, I think, and uh, Yasmin can also answer. So I, I, that's a very good, very valid question. And uh, of course, I think uh, 
Professor Shweta Bose earlier mentioned that he Ashura. is coming from a particular background, right? So his ideas also reflect that. Uh, of, of course, there's nobody who can personify the entire mono. I mean, the, the, that would imply the assumption of monolithic, monolithic identity, so which is not uh, in that case. Uh, he's he's a product of his time in in, the, in that, uh, and he he, he uh, let me also say that he's he's a human, right? So he's filled with all. Uh, he he's got his failures too. So many of the things that we are now seeing in terms of Pasmanda politics and in terms of representation of the larger numbers uh, within the Muslim population, uh, this. Uh, was of course not being debated or questioned at that time, right? So uh, he is representing, in some ways, of course, the Ashraf ethos uh, in in his ideas. And uh, in fact, if you look at who were the earliest students of the institution, the mostly came from the aristocratic backgrounds of uh, the United Provinces. So it's basically an institution that was built with a particular uh, viewpoint. The funding also came from the princely states, you know, but also from the average people. So he also reached out. Uh, I think I, I think the question is how he would have envisioned had he lived today. An institution is hard to answer, uh, but this is what he did, living in his own time, in his own time frame. Uh, he was not trying to be representative. Uh, the the reason why we talk about him as a, a person who personifies the Muslim Hin is with the idea about being rootedness, be, 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 being an advocate for rootedness within India. So he's talking about history, he's talking about archaeology, he's talking about the long-term heritage that the Muslim communities have in this country and the contributions that they have made in multiple fields. At the same time, does not hesitate in terms of adopting what was coming from the West at this time. Right. So it's, I think that the Indian Muslim is basically Indian on the one hand, the Muslim on the other, n does not mean representing <laughs> all of the Indian Muslims in some way. So, Thank you. And uh, we apparently have only five minutes. So I'm going to use my partisanship and ask a friend to very quickly make a point because we're running out of time. I just want to advance. Ten minutes. Sir. Ten minutes. Okay. I just want to take this, this thing a little further because now there is a lot of talk about caste, etc. And this discussion is not new. It's quite old now. I mean, if we go back to the publishing of the Kausam Zadi's work in the, based on 1931 <coughs> census, there is a caste categorization of Muslims, etc., and who would be really the spokesperson, you know? whether anyone personifies them or not. And this is a question which is actually very difficult to answer, and I think Raish is right, in particular given context, we can see whether, uh, in what ways would uh, Sir Sayyid represent the concerns of what the Muslims today face in India, you know, uh, in terms of rootedness, as well as in terms of, uh, you know, this particular idea about uh, rationality, uh, 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 along with the religious identity, which had to be uh, forwarded. But the question also sometimes comes to my mind is that many times we do not ask similar questions from other personalities of history. For example, I, 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 I really dare anyone would ask a similar question about Ambedkar. Does Ambedkar represent all the Dalits, or does he represent only the Mahars? You know, did he represent only the Mahars, or the Buddhist converts to, uh, to, to uh, so we, we do not know exactly. Yeah. So this is a question which is very difficult to answer. So far as prejudices and biases are concerned, Sir Sayyid was a person of his own period. He carried all kinds of biases which probably were prevalent in those periods. He also tried to overcome many of the biases. So we, it, it depends on whether we see the glass half full or half empty. That is okay. the thing. That's Tanvir Fazal, somebody was asking. He teaches at JNU sociology. And so, uh, but the, the quick one about why no more institutions no like Ali. I don't think there are no more institutions yeah. because there are huh, coffee institutions here. It starts with, like, let me give you examples. There are alumni who are actually building new universities. They don't go under the name Aligarh Muslim University or something. So there are many of them. And of course, Aligarh still has a cachet. People want, because it has a history and people want to be connected. But I, I would. You know, to defer with my senior here to say that there were there are many institutions that Aligarh uh, alumni have started because they have been inspired by Sir Sayyid and has taken the idea that education is a pathway for progress and for advancement, not just for jobs, but as I'm saying, for the human advancement. Okay, I see Apurvanand ji's hand up there, so I'm going to ask him to. Way too long. 
Oh, you, you've you been there, okay. First, we'll give a younger person. This is youth have been denied by the Congress, so we are going to give you a chance. Am I audible? Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Ms. Gautier speaks about the ambiguities of Sajay Mehta. So uh, perhaps some light should be, could be shed on uh, his stance on the Hindi Rudu controversy, which is perhaps quite relevant right now. And uh, second is an uh, uh, um, if I may be allowed to do and uh, my apologies. There is a slight uh, blunder in the book, uh, perhaps a printing error. That is. A uh, figure 21 says that the figure 21 shows a uh, hostile entrance, a gate, uh, which it says that is Sased South, uh, Sased North entrance, Babishtia, which in fact it is Victoria Gate, that is the entrance to Sased South Hall. Any other would recognize it, I'm sure uh, Ms. Sake would also. Mrs. Sake would also. Oh, well, I never went to Sir Sayed Hall. Women are okay. not allowed. <laughs> 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 Nowadays, you are allowed. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was, that was lovely. Uh, small, yeah, small, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Small observation. Uh, Ms. Cordier speaks uh, about, uh, like, there has been a lot of discussion about women education regarding to Sir Sayed Khan. So, the first Vice Chancellor of Aligarh Muslim University is a woman. Sultan Begum Jaha. I don't know how many other universities could yeah. have that or say that. Okay, that's, thank you. Thank, thank you. That's really nice. Interesting information. And Apurananji, please, Apna Sawal Puchi. I was going to say that the first thing that the first thing is 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 that किसी समुदाय ने संस्थान नहीं बनाया और जो उच्च शिक्षा संस्थान थे वो 1947 के पहले बनने का तरीका अलग था जिसमें आप नेशनल यूनिवर्सिटीज नेशनल कॉलेजेस कम्युनिटी कॉलेजेस बना रहे थे लेकिन 1947 के बाद ये माना गया कि ज्यादातर आप सेक्युलर इंस्टीट्यूशंस बनाएंगे और वो जिम्मा सरकार राज्य का जिम्मा है तो एक तो यह बात है जिसको ध्यान में रखना चाहिए और मुसलमानों को बहुत स्यापा नहीं करना चाहिए कि उन्होंने नहीं बनाया क्योंकि ये उनका काम नहीं था मुसलमानों के को को शिक्षा देना सिर्फ मुसलमानों का काम नहीं है और दूसरी ये इस इस दुविधा को भी ध्यान में रखना चाहिए जो मुसलमानों के द्वारा स्थापित किए गए शिक्षा संस्थानों के साथ जुड़ी हुई दुविधा है वो ये कि उन्हें एक एक खास ढंग से सेक्युलर खुद को साबित करना है क्योंकि हिंदुओं के द्वारा स्थापित किए गए संस्थान अपने आप ही सेक्युलर हो जाते हैं लेकिन मुसलमानों के द्वारा स्थापित किए गए संस्थानों को सेक्युलर होना पड़ता है और और यह चीज जामिया में लिया इस्लामिया को हाल में और अलीगढ़ मुस्लिम यूनिवर्सिटी को साबित करनी पड़ रही है और इसलिए सबसे ज्यादा हमले जो पिछले पांच साल में हुए हैं वो अलीगढ़ मुस्लिम यूनिवर्सिटी पर और जामिया में लिया इस्लामिया पर इस दुविधा को या इस डिलेमा को ध्यान में रखना चाहिए जब भी मुसलमान ये बोले कि वे अपनी संस्थान बनाएंगे आधा मिनट प्रोफेसर बंदूक वाला जैसे साइंटिस्ट बड़े इंटेलेक्चुअल्स अब ये मानने लगे हैं कि मुसलमानों को अपनी पूरी ताकत सिर्फ और सिर्फ शिक्षा संस्थान बनाने में या अपने लोगों को एडुकेट करने में या एंटरप्रेन्योरशिप में लगाने चाहिए इसका मतलब ये कि वे हिंदुस्तान के स्टेट से अब कम से कम उम्मीद कर रहे हैं कि वो उनके लिए कुछ कर सकेगा just a brief intervention in Juhapura, which is out town on the outskirts of Ahmedabad. We are we have diverted a bit from university. The amount of schools that have come up. It is a remarkable, there's data, there is work done on it. It is a story in itself. So it may not, you require a different kind of infrastructure for higher education, but Muslims are sending their children to school with a vengeance as protection. It's, it's also happening. But uh, I think we need to, if there's any really compelling question, please raise your hands. Otherwise, I'm just going to ask all my panelists to very, very briefly tell me, I mean, does the future, we are talking about a figure who happens, uh, who was a Muslim, who dealt, who, uh, who dealt with the idea of trying to bring the com community into modern, into a modern thing? When you look at what's happening today, have we failed? Have all the ideas which he had, the ideas of the India was created, all of this, are we standing at the cusp of failure? Very quickly, 
you know, I don't know if it's possible for an academic to reply quickly, but try. We can try. <laughs> Thank you. Professor Bose, Professor Gandhi, you know? Have you failed? Have you failed? No? Well, I think there's a much more general failure uh, of ours in the, uh, in, in the field of uh, higher education. In the post-independence period, we had completely neglected primary education. But we had, uh, <laughs> because we were elitist, set up some very fine institutions of higher education. And I think uh, in the 21st uh, century, we are more generally failing at that level. Yes, it, is, it is not just a question of Muslims and, uh, and higher education. Yes. But very briefly, I did want to respond to a question from uh, the, the young interlocutor here. The Hindi-Urdu controversy, I think, was absolutely critical in, uh, uh, in uh, Saeed Ahmad Khan's mind in terms of which direction to take Aligarh. To begin with, in his educational efforts, he had Hindu patrons, he welcomed Hindu students, but then what happened in the late 19th century with the demand for Hindi in the Devnagri script as the you know, official language, uh, 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 that, I think, convinced uh, Saeed Ahmad Khan that at least in his institution, he probably has to fall back much more uh, in you know, educating uh, the, the children of the Muslim uh, you know, Ashraf uh, of, of, the, of the United Provinces. And just to talk about the present a little bit, you know, there was the Hindi-Urdu controversy of the late 19th century, and then, let us not forget, there were the cow protection movements of the 1890s. And what was really worrying for so many of us uh, in at least the early part or the middle part of the second decade of the 21st century was that something of that majoritarian bigotry of the 1890s, and which resurfaced a bit in around 1926-27, and which peaked in 1947 leading to the partition, uh, was you know, once again, you know, resurfacing. And that's why, because we live in a, you know, moment of crisis, uh, I, I think we really need to, uh, you know, rediscover uh, intellectual figures uh, like uh, Saeed Ahmad Khan. Thank you so much. Professor Gandhi? <laughs> no person of commitment can admit failure. She or he will always say, I'll wait some more, I'm confident. And no person of faith can admit failure. Okay. I think that, that was brief indeed. Thank you so much. I just want to say that the questions that you have raised need to be addressed not just at the Indian level, but at the global level. I think that we can see democracy in danger, not just in India, but elsewhere. And so I think it's, you know, we have to have this reflection at a more general level. Right. Thank you. So, I think the failure is more on part of, as human beings, reaching, reaching out to each other. And that's something that many of the historical figures, not only Sayyid Ahmad Khan, but when you look around and find so many voices, that we need to bring back and hear from <coughs> about how people have lived in, 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 a, in a country like India, which has been, you know, pluralist, pluralism has been a hallmark of this country. So, how people have come together, lived together, reached out to each other, and you know, given spaces, and you talked about friendship. So I think that's something we, we, we are tired and all, are, are on and off, kind of uh, fallen off. So I think we need to uh, work on that more. So I get to say the last word. I think the Hindi would do controversy then, brother. I think it's a great way to sort of end this, because when Sir Sayyid um, was sort of opposing this idea of this rift, he was actually opposing the rift between two communities, because Hindi was then sort of moving more to the Sanskritized Hindu past, and, and the, the Urdu was then relinquished as if it's only a Muslim language. But Urdu, we know, is a language of India. It evolved here from Delhi. It is it's a hybrid pidgin language. So this rift is, I think, what for Sir Sayyid was the most troubling thing that Hindus and Muslims cannot part because then the concept of colonialism will continue beyond colonialism. The decolonization of the mind can only happen when we actually assert ourselves as autonomous people of India. Hence the Muslim is not a question of being 
Muslim in that sense, but being rooted. And as you may know, historically, it's in Akbar's period for the first time that you have the concept of the Hindustani Muslim. Before that, with all Turani, Irani, and all those other kinds of. So this is a long history of saying we belong here. We did not come from anywhere else, and we have a stake in this country, and will continue to contribute <laughs> to this country. It's a great message to take out, particularly to the West. Today, where Muslims are seen as terrorists, Muslims are the ones destroying, but here Muslims are the ones constructing, and constructing relationships which are so important. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. And uh, I think there's tea is on offer, and the, the two authors are here to sign any books. And I also you. want to uh, make a remark here. It was a wonderful discussion, no doubt about that, and we created an environment where Sabah can be questioned that, you know, uh, at the university event, why do we invoke the Quran? I want to share an experience here that, you know, even in 2019 and 18, as we have these office conferences or multinational offices, we do start all ceremonies with the light, uh, with the lighting of the lamp where the Gayatri Mantra and the Saraswati Vandana has been recited, it's been, uh, it's, it plays in the background. And we don't question that because we can't, because our secularism is at stake, at, yeah, at that's stake, right? Good